the year of the ox, the year of the ox, yes. And I guess, I guess there's like a 60 year cycle for these, uh, for these years and their personalities. And uh, so the uh, animal sign is sort of paired with a certain natural element uh, like wood or fire or water. In this case, it's, uh, it's pairing the ox with metal. Uh, and that has its very unique kind of uh, personality quality. So I'm on a website called China Highlights and it, it lists characteristics of the ox, particularly people who were born in a year of the ox. Uh, and this is what they have to say. Uh, the ox's personality, diligent and dependable. Uh, having an honest nature, oxes are known for diligence, dependability, strength, and determination. These reflect traditional conservative characteristics. Uh, women oxes are traditional faithful wives who attach great importance to their children's education. For male oxes, they are strongly patriotic have ideals and ambitions for life and attach importance to family and work. I don't know. It sounds like oxes uh, by nature should be Republicans. I don't know. Maybe, I'm, maybe <laughs> I've got this all backwards, but uh, who can say? We're going to have to do a survey about this. Uh, having great patience and the desire to make progress, oxes can achieve their goals by consistent effort. They are not much influenced by others or the environment, but persist in doing things according to their ideals and capabilities. Before taking any action, oxes will have a definite plan with detailed steps to which they apply their strong faith and physical strength. As a result, people of the ox zodiac sign often enjoy great success. Oxes are weakest in their communication skills. They are not good at communicating with others and even think it is not worthwhile to exchange ideas with others. They are stubborn and stick to their ways. Now, do we have any people who were born under the sign of the ox? And can you tell me if this is an accurate description or not? <laughs> uh. I know that I'm born under the sign of the dog and supposedly dogs and oxes do not get along. So uh, I guess maybe I should uh, uh, steer clear of the oxen. I don't know, we'll see. But I guess in this year, you can't uh, get too far. You can't, you can't get too far away from them. So anyways, good luck in the year of the ox. Um, so anyways, uh, this, uh, it's great that uh, we just run into these little bits of, uh, little bits of orientalism in our in our daily daily lives um, so so today we're going to be talking about uh the arabian nights the stories of the arabian nights and you know as usual when i start to get into a subject like this i find that i initially am operating uh, under a number of misapprehensions about the subject i mean for example the, the title Arabian Nights, that's not really the original title of the, uh, of the collection. Uh, the original title in the, in the Arabic was um, something like Alf Leila Wa Leila, uh, roughly translating as the 1001 Nights. So uh, there was nothing, nothing specifically the Arabian, in the Arabian Nights in the original uh, language of these stories. It only received that name or that, that, that moniker uh, from uh, the first uh, major English translation, what they call the Grub Street translation, just a bunch of hack writers translating these tales into English. And in that version, uh, it was called the Arabian Nights Entertainments. So, uh, so it's really owned only in this first English version that we re first received this title, Arabian Nights. And it, a lot of people would say that it's kind of a, a mistake to call it Arabian Nights because the very title is misleading. 
yes, uh, the manuscript that it's largely drawn from is in Arabic. But the stories aren't purely stories from Arabian folklore. A lot of the stories hearken to a, a Persian storytelling tradition. Some people think some of these stories have their origins in uh, Indian, subcontinent Indian uh, legends. Uh, and then some, some people even trace some of these stories further east into uh, Indochina. Uh, I mean, the, orig the original telling of the story of Aladdin has it set in China, for example. Uh, uh, there's, there's a, uh, and oh, you know, uh, you know the, 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 you know the, the, the setup for, for the uh, One Thousand and One Nights is, you know, this notion of this uh, uh, beautiful woman, this Scheherazade, telling stories to her king, uh, and uh, the, the names for these characters come from Middle Persian. Uh, so so the, the woman uh, narrator figure uh, in the in Middle Persian is called Sharazad, which literally means of a noble lineage. Okay, so, so that's this Queen Sharazad. Uh, and her king is called Sharyar. And in, in, the, in the Middle Persian, it, it comes from a word Sardar, which means holder of the realm. So, so these names of these key characters in this collection comes from the Persian. And some uh, literary historians suggest that uh, perhaps that there is a core of Persian st stories that were translated into the Arabic and then these stories started to continue to be, you know, collected and, uh, and uh, put into the Arabic and it became almost a kind of Islamiz Islamization of these, um, of these original Persian uh, centered stories. Uh, so uh, certainly there's a lot of Arabic folklore in these collections. And I'd say though, as the centuries went on, it became more Arabic as the time went on, but uh, initially uh, it has a different uh, provenance. So probably, you know, in terms of the content, probably better to call it the 1001 nights uh, so uh, so yeah a little bit of a uh, little bit of confusion in terms of uh, the way the, the collection is titled another misapprehension for me at least is that I always thought if it's called the 1001 nights there have to be 1001 stories surely uh, they they must have a bit of truth in advertising in the way they call the collection. But uh, no, there aren't 1,001 stories. And you know, it kind of makes sense when, when you think about it because some of these stories are pretty darn long stories. Uh, I mean, like uh, the, the story of Aladdin uh, it runs a hundred plus pages, I'd say. It's really more of a novella than a, than a short story. And you probably would need a couple nights to tell the full story of Aladdin if you're really, you know, thinking it through. If you're not doing the abridged version, at least. So, uh, and then, yeah, again, there are some stories that are very brief, it's very curt, but there are others that tend to go on and on and on. Uh, and uh, you just could not tell some of these stories in one night. So it would make sense that yes, uh, some of these stories would have to be interrupted for a little shut eye and continue on in the following night. So that, that certainly ma makes sense. So, you know, I, I was looking up in the index uh, in this wonderful collection called the Arabian Nights Encyclopedia. It's like everything you could ever wanted to know about the Arabian Nights were, were afraid to ask are in these two volumes. Uh, and, you know, in the back of this second volume, there is this list of all these tales and you can see them numbered from one to whatever. Anyway, the last, the last tale that they have in this collection is like about 551. So a little, little over half of, of 1001. It's still a whole lot of stories. I don't think anyone could claim that uh, they don't give you your money's worth if you don't get a thousand and one stories. But uh, uh, I, I would say that uh, you know, that certainly was something that uh, I was uh, 
you know, mistaken about. So, uh, so uh, anyways, I was, I was definitely, uh, you know, given a, a bit of a, a, a teach, given a teaching moment there. Um, and, you know, an another, another thing about this, uh, about this uh, collection is that the most famous stories in this collection weren't originally part of the first major manuscript of, of, of the Arabian Nights that was first discovered. Uh, uh, so what are, what are the most famous stories in this collection? Who can, who can name uh, the, the real big ones? Aladdin. Okay, Aladdin. Ali I thought Baba that was a good 40, Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves. Ali mm. Baba and the 40 Thieves. And uh, what's the other of the big three? Sinbad. Sinbad, yes. Mm. So I'd say, you know, to the general person on the street in whatever part of the world, uh, generally those are, those are the, the three stories that everyone has uh, uh, an awareness of if they haven't actually read them themselves. And those three stories, not in the original manuscript. Wow. Those, are, those are later accretions to this story. Oh. And, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, there's a modern uh, English translation of the book that of the collection came out in, in 1990, uh, translated by a fellow named uh, uh, Hussein Hadawi. Uh, based on a uh, based on a, a modern critical edition of uh, of the collection uh, by another uh, Arabic scholar, Musin Mahdi, uh, and it says based on the text of the 14th century Syrian manuscript, and that 14th century Syrian manuscript does not have those three uh, tales in it, uh, and yeah, so. <laughs> So you know, this is, it's a it's a marvelous publication, and uh, they certainly have a lot of interesting tales in it. But the but the the stories that you know really make uh, the Arabian Nights reputation uh, isn't in here. So I think I think uh, Hadawi did come up with a second volume of stories that that were not part of that original manuscript, and I'm sure those stories are in that uh, that second volume. But, uh, but it's, I think it's very interesting for us to be aware that, uh, that uh, Aladdin, Sinbad, and uh, Alibaba are not part of the heart of, uh, of this collection. Uh, they're like icing on the cake, let, let us say. Uh, but uh, that, uh, that they're, they, they're not central to this Arabic storytelling uh, cre uh, tradition. And, uh, I'd say largely uh, we can uh, we can attribute the fact that they are part of this tradition to the fact that uh, that this uh, that this uh, collection was discovered by a European Orientalist and uh, and that putting this collection into a major European language opened this. Uh, opened this collection out to uh, a wider audience. Uh, another misconception is that, uh, that uh, the Arabian Nights are a central kind of cultural birthright uh, to the people living in the Middle East, and that, that this is something that has long been cherished by, by, those, by those people, uh, and that um, you know, this is uh, you know, kind of central to their uh, literature. And it's not the case, or at least it wasn't the case. Uh, I would say that people who were into uh, poetry and stories and fiction back in those, you know, late medieval, early Renaissance days probably thought that these were really kind of junky, vulgar, uh, lower class kinds of stories uh, and that uh, did not have the kind of... Uh, uh, you know, literary elegance and well-spokenness that uh, that they would think should be in the forefront uh, of uh, you know the reputation of, say, Arabic literature. Uh, it's only the fact that 
that uh, this uh, European translation and publication of uh, the Thousand and One Nights gave it this worldwide uh, uh, attention and and consequent popularity. Uh, so uh, so it's 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 really something that is uh, has been propounded uh, and uh, pushed by Western culture. This this collection, the Arabian Nights, and uh, I would say that. Uh, if, if it wasn't for the enthusiasm for the uh, kind of uh, mania for these Arabian Nights stories that European readers had for them uh, starting in the 18th century, that, uh, you know, this probably would have sort of faded in people's memories uh, in, uh, you know, in the Near East. Uh, so it's, it's a very interesting example how, you know, of East meeting West and in a sense, the West just taking this ball, ball and, and running with it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very interesting how, you know, uh, it's really uh, the European literary tra tradition that really started to make this a big thing in the Middle East again, you know, after many centuries of probably uh, benign uh, neglect. Uh, let's, uh, let's read a little bit from the introduction uh, of this translation by Hussein Hadoui. And uh, after describing how uh, he first came in contact with these stories by having a, a grandmother, you know, telling stories from these traditional tales, you know, just as like bedtime stories, uh, he talks about uh, the tales in, in general, how he has come to look at them. He says, um, uh, Everybody, at least where he lived in, uh, in Iraq, everybody has loved them, for they enchanted the young and the old alike with their magic. In the nights themselves, tales divert, cure, redeem, and save lives. Shahrazad cures Sharayar of his hatred of women, teaches him to love, and by doing so, saves her own life and wins a good man. The Caliph Harum al-Rashid al al finds more fulfillment in satisfying his sense of wonder by listening to a story than in his sense of justice or his thirst for revenge. And the King of China spares four lives when he finally hears a story that is stranger than a strange episode from his own life. Even angry demons are humanized and pacified by a good story. And everyone, is always ready to oblige, for everyone has a strange story to tell. And then he uh, specifies, the work consists of four categories of folk tales, fables, fairy tales, romances, and comic, as well as historical anecdotes, the last two often merging into one. Uh, they are divided into nights in sections of various lengths, a division that, although it follows no particular plan, serves a dual purpose. It keeps Sharayar and us in suspense and brings the action to a more familiar level of reality. The essential quality of these tales lies in their success in interweaving the unusual, the extraordinary, the marvelous, and the supernatural into the fabric of everyday life. So, so the juxtaposition of the normally everyday and the uh, marvelous, the extraordinary. Animals discourse and give lessons in moral philosophy. Normal men and women consort or struggle with demons and like them change themselves or anyone else into any form they please. And humble people lead a life full of accidents and surprises, drinking with an exalted caliph here or sleeping with a gorgeous girl there. Yet both the, both the usual incidents and the extraordinary coincidences are nothing but the web and weft of, in capital letters, divine providence. In a world in which people often suffer but come out all right at the end, they are enriched by the pleasure of a marvelous adventure and a sense of wonder, which makes life possible. As for the readers, their pleasure is vicarious and aesthetic, 
derived from the escape into an exotic world of wish fulfillment and from the underlying act of transformation and the consequent pleasure, which may be best defined in Freudian terms as the sudden overcoming of an obstacle. And I'll, do, I'll just stop there. Now, another aspect of this uh, influence of the Western culture into the Eastern cultural realm, you, uh, you might well say that the Arabianites are an example of Orientalism, of, uh, of, a, of great uh, literary scholars of the West basically saying, this, this is a great piece of, of literary art, this, this uh, 1001 Nights, and uh, we, we need to tell the whole world about it and even, even suggest to the people in the, in the Orient, well, you don't know what you're missing. I mean, this is a great cultural treasure. You need to start reading these stories as well and retelling them and, and evaluating them in, in a more uh, uh, proud manner than perhaps you're, you're doing right now. Uh, so, so in a sense, again, it's uh, as, Saeed, as Edward Said might say that uh, the, here's a case of the West uh, trying to, you know, tell the tell the East that uh, uh, we know better than you. Uh, so uh, uh, there's a, a lovely essay in this Arabian Nights encyclopedia called "The Arabian Nights as an Orientalist Text" uh, by a, a writer named Rana Kabbani. Uh, let's just let's just dip into this a little bit to see what uh, Kabani is uh, is referring to. Um, she uh, 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 Kabani says it would certainly seem bizarre if, say, all of French literature were to be ignored in favor of the antics of Grignon. So uh, he's referring to Grand Grignol, a uh, uh, sort of a bloodthirsty form of. Uh, of theater that uh, the French have a taste for. Um, and it certainly would be bizarre if the tales compiled by the brothers Grimm, however evocative, were all that were known of German literature and were considered all that was needed for an understanding of the German people. But that is the situation suggested by the West's obsessive familiarity with the Arabian Nights to the exclusion of the majority of other narratives. This phenomenon may be at least partially may be at least partially explained by the fact that the knights, in many respects, are a Western text, a manufactured product of Orientalism, still as much in currency today as at the beginning of the 18th century, when the knights first made their appearance in the guise of a translation into a European language by way of Antoine Galland's French. Ad adaptation. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to uh, Antoine Galland uh, later. Um, in the authentic context of their native reality, the stories included in the Arabian Nights had been folk tales, many of them kept alive orally and narrated over the centuries by itinerant storytellers, who with each retelling larded the tales with further details and jingles reflecting their own particular tastes and backgrounds, emerging from the oral folkloric traditions of India, Persia, Iraq, Syria, and Egypt. The stories tended to mirror the prejudices about class, race, and gender that for a host of economic and political reasons were popularly prevalent in those societies. Recounted in a vulgar vernacular Arabic, the TV soap operas of their day, they would never have been considered cultivated literature. In the rare instances when they were mentioned by men of letters such as al-Masudi uh, Muraj al-Adahab, they were dismiss dismissed as entertainment of an inferior sort. Ibn al-Nadim, writing like al-Masudi in the 10th century, believed them to have no literary merit, although he considered rather disdainfully that they were popular among the illiterate. So who, go figure, go figure. <laughs> exactly when these stories were first written down remains controversial, but it seems clear that it was done to preserve them. The manuscripts that resulted must have been 
as amorphous and diverse in content as the oral versions themselves had been. It was only when the French scholar Antoine Galland, uh, encountering these mercurial stories, decided to translate them and produce a carefully composed and set text with all the precious mannerisms of courtly French. At that, it's th at that point that the Arabian Nights became the concrete creation of Western rather than Arabic literature and fancy. Galland's text was to retain its monopoly as a document in European letters for well over a century from 1704 to 1838, when different editions began appearing, uh, 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 began appearing that challenged the spirit of the first uh, tra translation. So, so Antoine Gal Galland, uh, G L double G A double -L, L A N D, Antoine Galland. Uh, so this was uh, a fellow who was a very, uh, Im very prominent uh, student of, uh, of uh, Near Eastern culture. Uh, and uh, uh, he actually was a student of a, of a major French scholar of the Orient uh, with the last name Derbolo. I think his name is Bartholomew, uh, Derbolo, yeah, Bartholomew Derbolo. Uh, and uh, and uh, I guess this uh, teacher, Derbalo, was working on a major encyclopedia, uh, was called the Bibliothèque Orientale, or Oriental Library. It was kind of an encyclopedia of not notable, uh, notable subjects dealing with the cultures uh, in, the, in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, I guess when uh, the teacher died, in 1695, uh, this Antoine Galland, his student, uh, was was determined to complete the work on this in, encyclopedia. And uh, you know, many many people who are you know specialists in uh, this field uh, consider this Bibliothèque uh, uh, Orientale to be perhaps the most important work of this Galland uh, figure. Um, but uh, you know. You know, after dealing with that major project, uh, he he was also an important translator of, of other literature. I think that he uh, Galland did the first major uh, translation of uh, the early English epic uh, Beowulf, for example. So he he was a very you know formidable uh, scholar on on ancient texts, uh, and I guess uh, uh, you know he did some work as a as a diplomat, uh, you know, in the French. Foreign Service, uh, and he, you know, spent some years in uh, Turkey, in Constantinople, uh, and he became very, very knowledgeable firsthand at, uh, you know, the cultures uh, of uh, of the Near East at that point. Uh, and I guess, uh, you know, while he was there, he found a, you know, a manuscript uh, that contained this story that we now call Sinbad the Sailor. Uh, and uh, you know, when he took this back. Uh, to, to France to, to study, uh, he was very, very interested uh, in this literature. And he was determined to find more examples of this kind of uh, storytelling. He felt that this was important uh, literature for, uh, for him to uh, preserve and to introduce to, uh, to a European readership. So uh, he, uh, he was able to uh, you know, obtain manuscripts uh, of, I think, from, of, a, of a Syrian Provenance uh, and have them uh, have them sent uh, have, have sent to him, um, you know, for study in uh, in France. Uh, and among the the manuscripts that were sent to him, I think were at least three large volumes of stories that became kind of the uh, core of uh, what we now know as the uh, Ar Arabian Nights. Uh, and uh, this Galland felt to be a, a truly uh, astonishing treasure trove uh, uh, of tales. And uh, so he, he was determined that this was going to be his, uh, you know, one of his major uh, scholarly uh, projects. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the uh, article about Galland in, the, uh, in, the, in Wikipedia uh, says that uh, 
translated the first part of his work solely from this Syrian manuscript. Uh, but then it says in 1709, he was introduced to a, a Christian from Aleppo, Syria, uh, named Hanna Diab. And Hanna Diab happened to be a great person with a story, you know. Uh, he was a great, uh, you know, just oral storyteller. And, uh, uh, but I think that not only did he have this gift of the gab, he also had access to manuscripts of his own. And supposedly, Galland was able to obtain certain manuscripts uh, from, uh, from this Hanna Diab, this Maronite Christian from Aleppo. Uh, and among these stories are Aladdin and Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves, plus a few others. Uh, modern day scholars call a lot of these stories that uh, Hanna Diab supplied, a lot of them call these tales orphan tales. Uh, and uh, Galland very cagely managed to integrate these stories given to him by Hanna Diab into the body of his translation of the 1001 Nights. Uh, and uh, and with, with this, uh, you know, with these additional stories added to it, uh, uh, these stories started to be published in the early uh, 1700s. Uh, and these stories really started to cause a great sense of, uh, you know, uh, excitement among, among uh, his, uh, his readership. Uh, and uh, 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 this really began, in a sense, this uh, craze, uh, this sense of, a, uh, a sense of, a, you know, a mania for things uh, uh, Arabian and things, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, M M Middle Eastern. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, you know the the Arabian Nights uh, guidebook says uh, the book was published at a time of intellectual secularism when Europeans were able to have their curiosity aroused and their imagination seduced by non-Christian cultures. Although Islamic civilization continued to be regarded with suspicion, arguably because of the former Ottoman military threat. Well, that's that's a big reason. The appearance of the Arabian Nights nevertheless produced an unprecedented, unprecedented frenzy of excitement. However, the disjunction remains, remained between literary myth and political reality. Uh, the more fully the area fell under the sway of European powers, namely the Middle East, the more vividly it came to figure in European literature, painting, music, and fashion. Turkish rondos and damask turbans became all the rage. Bourgeois patricians sat for their portraits in Eastern costume against backdrops of Oriental hangings, as if to signal that wealth that could afford such important imported luxuries. Uh, newly amassed fortunes often were the product of an increasingly exploitative trade with the East. The fascination with a make-believe location ran parallel with the penetration of real Eastern markets. So it's a very interesting phenomenon. The more uh, Europeans became uh, engrossed in trade, uh, commerce with the East, the more the culture of the East began to affect uh, the West. So that's a, that's a really interesting dy dynamic. Uh, one of the things that is most fascinating about this collection of stories is is the fact that they're structured in a way that is really non-Western. Uh, there's something that is called uh, the frame story. Uh, it's a story that acts as kind of like a picture frame to a painting. It surrounds all the other stories. And, and in this case, uh, the big frame story in the Arabian Nights is this story of uh, Scheherazade telling uh, the story uh, telling stories to her king in, uh, in the hopes of being, uh, being able to hold off her own imminent demise. Uh, that, she's, uh, that, that, that the king is like a kind of an oriental bluebeard who will do away with his wife after one night of pleasure. Uh, and, uh, and she keeps telling story after story to stave off the inevitable. 
so I think it's that that image is very strongly ingrained in uh, in the Western imagination. Even people who have never read the the Arabian Nights, they still know about this notion about you know telling stories as a way of self uh, pr preservation. Um, so so that large frame story is very key to the structure of the Arabian Nights. But it's not just that frame. Uh, there are also ex examples of uh, what uh, Wikipedia calls embedded stories, uh, stories within stories. Uh, it would seem that the people who uh, populate the Arabian Nights don't just talk in one-liners, wisecracks, you know, clever anecdotes. It seems like people talk in stories. Uh, they, they're just, uh, it's really hard to uh, suppress that storytelling urge in these tales. Uh, and, uh, and so, so many of the stories in, these, in this collection are made up of stories in which within the story, characters tell other stories. It's almost like a building in which you're on the ground floor and then you have to make a detour into the basement and then you find you have to make a detailed detour into a sub basement. It's still part of the same building, but you're operating on these different levels. Uh, and that's the way it is with this, uh, this 1001 Nights. Uh, it's like uh, you're in, a, in a, like a little narrative maze and hopefully you can keep track of where you are throughout each of these different uh, levels. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, among the uh, core stories in, in Galland's uh, translation from this initial Syrian text, uh, there's a story called The Porter and the Three Ladies of Baghdad. Okay, it's not a story that I was familiar with, but it's, it's a very, very entertaining story. And uh, let's see, uh, let me just read a, uh, let me just read a, a, an, abbre an abbreviated summary of this story, just to give you a flavor of, of what it's like, okay? Just, just so you get a sense of the, the general structure. So Porter, and the three ladies of Baghdad, okay? A porter in Baghdad is asked by a beautiful woman to follow her and to carry her purchases. She buys food, drink, and other necessities for a festive evening. In entering her home, the porter encounters two other beautiful young women in the house and refuses to leave. Since the porter is a witty fellow and the women consent to his participating in the party, uh, uh, the women consent to his participating in the party, a hilariously funny and luxurious evening follows. In a highly exceptional scene, the porter splashes in the pool with the young women and they have great fun naming their naming each other's private parts. I, I think I, I must have fell asleep when they got to that. I, I don't remember that. Uh, well, I'll have to reread that one. Eventually, three mendicants or beggars, three mendicants knock on the door and ask permission to enter. All of them have shaved their beard and brows and their left eyes are blind. They are allowed in on condition that they will not ask importunate, importunate questions. Um, following this, the company indulges in merrymaking and music. The noise of their party is heard outside the building. And they attract the attention of Caliph Harun al-Rashid, who is roaming the city together with his vizier, Jafar the Barmakid, and his executioner, Mazrur, disguised as merchants. They ask permission to join the party and are admitted in on the same condition, not to ask questions about events that are not their own concern. At a certain point, one of the ladies brings in two dogs from an adjoining room and lashes them with a whip only to console them afterward. Later, the two other women are driven to distress by a love song and reveal that their bodies are covered with scars. The caliph can hardly control his curiosity. And finally, the porter asks about the mystery behind the scenes they have witnessed. Enraged that he has broken the taboo, the women call in seven black slaves who threaten to kill the visitors with their swords. However, 
the guests are first asked to tell their stories. And the three mendicants do so. And thus follows the first colander's tale. Well, colander is a uh, Persian word for a, a you know, beggar, uh, sort of a holy beggar. Uh, the first calendar's tale, and then the second calendar's tale, and then the third calendar's tale. And following that, Jafar, the, the vizier, tells a fake story to hide his true identity and the caliph's true identity. And then all the visitors are released. But the following morning, the caliph orders the entire company to be brought to the palace and asks the women to tell their stories, which they do. For example, there's the, the tale of the eldest lady and then the tale of the portress, uh, the, the, the woman who first enlist, enlisted the help of the porter. And in the end, the caliph summons the, the jinyaya who cast the spells originally and orders her to restore the dogs to their normal shape. Sorry to be a spoiler. Uh, okay, so you can see in this story about the porter and the three ladies of Baghdad, there are all these little stories uh, in, folded into it. There's the three stories by these beggars, these kalandars, uh, and then you have the stories of the, of the, of the two of the ladies, the eldest lady, eldest lady and the tale of the port, porteress, uh, and there are even a couple other stories that they skipped. Uh, the tale is awash in little stories within the main frame of the story. And this seems to be kind of a taste uh, that is uh, endemic in these, uh, in these uh, storytellers of the, of the Middle East. Uh, I, I have a feeling that, uh, you know, these people who uh, tell stories on the street in these various uh, villages and towns, uh, they probably think, well, if I just tell one story, I'm just going to get one dinar of, of reward from the crowd. But, but if, I, if I fold in another story, maybe I'll get another dinar. It might be that notion of folding in another story is a way to uh, make a little extra money for the professional uh, storyteller. In any case, this oral storytelling tradition becomes, uh, you know, part of this written literary storytelling tradition that the Arabian Nights tales uh, uh, exemplify. Now, now, what I, another misapprehension that I had about the Arabian Nights was that these stories were basically stories for kids. I mean, I mean, you see Disney retailing movies like Aladdin and, uh, you know, uh, you know, the Thief of Baghdad, this big swashbuckling, you know, spectacular with Douglas Fairbanks, you know, all that stuff. Uh, these are meant to, you know, excite the cockles of young readers and young moviegoers and all that kind of thing. And, uh, and we just tend to think of uh, that's the audience that the Arabianites are intended to be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, sort of focused for. Uh, but that's not really the case. I think, generally speaking, people have generally gotten kind of a watered down view of these stories. These stories are full of adult themes. You know, there's a lot of infidelity. There's a lot of murder, a lot of killing. There's a lot of, uh, th there's a lot of, uh, you know, nasty behavior that, that goes on. And there's a lot of sex in these stories. Uh, you can't, you, stuff you just can't, can't ignore. Uh, you know, this, and this notion of, uh, in this frame story, this large frame story of the, uh, you know, this, sh this uh, king, who uh, uh, is, uh, you know, acting almost like a kind of Orientalist, uh, you know, bluebeard, you know, uh, killing each of his wives after the first night, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, after wedding. Uh, uh, this is a bloodthirsty concept. You know, what's what's uh, childish or kid-like about these uh, about these stories? Um, and uh, and and plus, they're very. I'd say in our modern terminology, very patriarchal stories. Uh, it's a lot of these stories deal with the notion that that uh, men can't trust women and their feminine wiles, and uh, you gotta watch them like a hawk, or they will step out on you uh, at a with a drop of a feather. You know, uh, it's it's a it's kind of a not so uh, great look at this male female dynamic in uh, in Arabian 
uh, culture. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's not kid stuff by any means. And uh, this is something that uh, I think takes one aback. Michael? So, yes. So you mentioned that it's not necessarily historically correct, but it certainly is culturally correct. Yeah, I mean, no one would call these stories a, uh, you know, a documentary look at life in the Middle East, you know, in the, in middle, in the, in the middle Ages or, or in the Renaissance uh, eras. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think they certainly reflect certain uh, cultural attitudes uh, with, without any question. I think you can't help but uh, put these stories in, a, in some kind of a cultural context. But uh, Yeah, yeah, there, I think there is definitely that strong <laughs> feeling. And yet, even so, uh, the notion <laughs> that, the uh, that there could be, the notion that there could be this figure of Scheherazade who manages to outwit the king and manage to, manages to save her skin for a thousand and one nights uh, shows that she's able to, you know, beat the king at his own, uh, uh, you know, uh, his own patriarchal game, you know, through sheer uh, in, ingenuity. So, uh, uh, you know, so it's an interesting thing, the notion that, uh, that the uh, framers of these tales could offer this notion of a, a certain kind of uh, girl power uh, alternative to the patriarchy, just in the way this these stories are are framed in, in the in the collection. Uh, that's that's an interesting uh, concept. But meanwhile, uh, I never really was aware of why the king would want to behave in this way. I mean, you've got this this tr tremendously attractive, very beautiful weaver of stories. Why would you want to? Why would you want to have her decapitated? You know, after the first story. You know, uh, why would why would any king want to do that? Well, there's a backstory to this king. There is a story behind the story, or a story before the main story that we all know about that sets it up. And uh, when you read the backstory, you kind of guy you kind of have to half admit. Well, you know. I can't really blame the king for, for thinking the way he does. Uh, he has reason to be uh, uh, a feared. He has reason to be suspicious, as they say. Uh, so let me offer you a little bit of this backstory at the very beginning of this uh, Arabian Nights, these thousand and one nights. And oh golly, we're running over. Let, let me just read a little of this and, and then we'll take our break just so we can get a, a sense of what we're getting into. So beginning, the story, the prologue, the story of King Sharayar and Sharazad, his vizier's daughter. Uh, this, is, uh, this is taken from Hussein Hadaway's uh, translation. It is related, but God knows and sees best What's, what's, what lies hidden in the, in the old accounts of bygone peoples and times, that long ago, during the time of the Sassanid dynasty, in the peninsulas of India and Indochina, ah, there's a clue that th these stories may not be all part of an Arabian cultural heritage. Uh, uh, in the peninsulas of India and Indochina, there lived two kings who were brothers. The older brother was named Sharayar, the younger Shazaman. The older Sharayar was a towering knight and a daring champion, invincible, energetic, and implacable. His power reached the remotest corners of the land and its people so that the country was loyal to him and his subjects obeyed him. Sharayar himself lived and ruled in India and Indochina, while his brother he gave the land, while to his brother he gave the land of Samarkand to rule as king. Ten years went by, and when one day Sharayar felt a longing for his brother, the king, summoned his vizier, who had two daughters, one called Sharazad and the other Dinarzad, and bade him go to his brother. Having made preparations, the vizier journeyed day and night until he reached Samarkand. When Shah Zaman heard of the vizier's arrival, he went out with his retainers to meet him. He dismounted, embraced him, 
and asked him for news from his older brother, Sharayar. The vizier replied that he was well and that he had sent him to request his brother to visit him. Shah Zaman complied with his brother's request and proceeded to make preparations for the journey. In the meantime, he had the vizier camp on the outskirts of the city and took care of his needs. He sent him what he required of food and fodder, slaughtered many sheep in his honor, and provided him with money and supplies, as well as many horses and camels. For 10 full days, he prepared himself for the journey, and then he appointed a chamberlain in his place and left the city to spend the night in his tent near the vizier. At midnight, he returned to his palace in the city to bid his wife goodbye. But when he entered the palace, he found his wife lying in the arms of one of the kitchen boys. When he saw them, the world turned dark before his eyes, and shaking his head, he said to himself, I am still here, and, and this is what she has done when I was barely outside the city? How will it be, and what will happen behind, behind my back when I go to visit my brother in India? No, women are not to be trusted. He got exceedingly angry, adding, by God, I am king and sovereign in Samarkand, yet my wife has betrayed me and has inflicted this on me. As his anger boiled, he drew his sword and struck both his wife and the cook. And then he dragged them by the heels and threw them from the top of the palace to the trench below. He then left the city and going to the vizier, ordered that they depart that very hour. The drum was struck and they set out on their journey while Shaz while Shazaman's heart was on fire because of what his wife had done to him and how she had, be had betrayed him uh, with some cook, some kitchen boy. They journeyed hurriedly day and night through deserts and wilds until they reached the land of King Sharayar, who had gone out to receive them. When Sharayar met them, he embraced his brother, showed him favors, and treated him generously. He offered him he offered him quarters in the palace adjoining his own, for King Shariar had built two beautiful towering palaces in his garden, one for the guests, the other for the women and members of his household. He gave the guest house to his brother, Shazaman, after the attendants had gone to scrub it, dry it, furnish it, and open its windows, which overlooked the garden. Thereafter, Shazaman would spend the whole day at his brother's, then return at night to sleep at the palace, then go back to his brother the next morning. But whenever he found himself alone and thought of his ordeal with his wife, he would sigh deeply and then stifle his grief and say, alas, this, that this great misfortune should have happened to one in my position. And then he would fret with anxiety, his spirit would sag, and he would say, none has seen what I have seen. In his depression, he ate less and less, grew pale, and his health deteriorated. He neglected everything, wasted away, and looked ill. When King Sharayar looked at his brother and saw how day after day he lost weight and grew thin, pale, ashen, and sickly, he thought that this was because of his expatriation and homesickness for his country and his family. And he said to himself, my brother is not happy here. I should prepare a goodly gift for him and send him home. For a month, he gathered gifts for his brother, and then he invited him to see him and said, Brother, I would like you to know that I intend to go hunting and, to pr and pursue the roaming deer for 10 days, and then I shall return to prepare for you for your journey home. Would you like to go hunting with me? Shazaman replied, Brother, I feel distracted and depressed. Leave me here and go with God's blessing and help. When Sharayar heard his brother, he thought that his dejection was because of his homesickness for his country. Not wishing to coerce him, he left him behind and set out with his retainers and men. When they entered the wilderness, he deployed his men in a circle to begin trapping and hunting. After his brother's departure, Shah Zaman stayed in the palace and from the window, overlooking the garden, watched the birds and trees as he thought of his wife and what she had done to him and sighed in sorrow. While he agonized over his misfortune, 
gazing at the heavens and turning a distracted eye on the garden, the private gate of his brother's palace opened, and there emerged, strutting like a dark-eyed deer, the lady, his brother's wife, uh, with 20 slave girls, 10 white and 10 black. While Shazaman looked at them without being seen, they continued to walk until they stopped below his window without looking in his direction, thinking that he had gone to the hunt with his brother. Then they sat down, took off their clothes, and suddenly there were 10 slave girls and 10 black slaves. Uh, dressed in the same clothes as the girls. Then the 10 black slaves mounted the 10 girls while the ladies called, while the lady called Masood, Masood. And the black slave jumped from the tree to the ground, rushed to her and raising her legs, went between her thighs and made love to her. Masood, topped the lady while the 10 slaves topped the 10 girls and they carried on till noon. When they were done with their business, they got up and washed themselves. Then the 10 slaves put on the same clothes again, mingled with the girls, and once more there appeared to be 20 slave girls. Masood himself jumped over the garden wall and disappeared while the slave girls and lady sauntered to the private gate, went in and locking the gate behind them, went their way. Nice. <laughs> All of this happened under King Shazaman's eyes. When he saw this spectacle of the wife and the women of his brother, the great king, how 10 slaves put on women's clothes and slept with his brother's paramours and concubines, and what Masood did with his brother's wife in his very palace, and pondered over this calamity and great misfortune, his care and sorrow left him. And he said to himself, this is our common lot. Even though my brother is king and master of the whole world, he cannot protect what is his, his wife and his concubines, and suffers misfortune in his very house. What happened to me is little by comparison. I used to think that I was the only one who has suffered, but from what I have seen, everyone suffers. By God, my misfortune is lighter than that of my brother. He kept marveling and blaming life whose trials none can escape. And he began to find consolation in his own affliction and forget his grief. When supper came, he ate and drank with relish and zest and feeling better, kept eating and drinking, enjoying himself and feeling happy. He thought to himself, I am no longer alone in my misery. I am well. Well, just to skip ahead a little bit, when his brother Shariar comes back from the hunt, he notices, strangely enough, his brother looking in much greater spirits. He looks like he's filled out a little from heartily eating and drinking, and he's trying to figure out what's happened. What's, what, why has he suddenly turned this corner and become uh, well and good-natured and, and healthy again? And, uh, and so uh, Shazaman, uh, Shazaman said, uh, uh, he tells him about, uh, he tells him first about why he was ill, why he, why he grew ill. Uh, and King Shariar heard his brother's ex explanation and he shook his head, greatly amazed at the deceit of women and prayed to God to protect him from their wickedness, saying, brother, you were fortunate in killing your wife and her lover who gave you good reason to feel troubled, careworn and ill. In my opinion, what happened to you has never happened to anyone else. By God, if I had been in your place, I would have killed at least a hundred or even a thousand women. I would have been furious. I would have gone mad. That's what you call foreshadowing. Note. Uh, now, praise be to God who has delivered you from sorrow and distress. But tell me, what has caused you to forget your sorrow and regain your health? Shazaman replied, King, I wish that for God's sake you would excuse me from telling you. But Shariya said, you must. Shazaman replied, I fear you will feel even more troubled and careworn than I. But the king forced him. And Shazaman told him about what he had seen from the palace window and the calamity in his own house, how 10 slaves dressed like women were sleeping with his women and concubines day and night. He told him everything from beginning to end, but there is no point in repeating that. Then he concluded, 
when I saw your own misfortune, I felt better and said to myself, my brother is king of the world, yet such a misfortune has happened to him and in his very home. And as a result, I forgot my care and sorrow and relaxed and began to eat and drink. This is the cause of my cheer and good spirits. So who's feeling bad now? Uh, so uh, when, when King Shariar heard this, he could not uh, believe it. Um, and Shazaman says, if you don't believe me, un unless you see your misfortune with your own eyes, announce you plan to go hunting. Then you and I shall set out with your troops. And when we get outside the city, we shall leave our tents and camp with the man behind, enter the city secretly and go together to your palace. And then the next morning, you can see with your own eyes. So they do that. They go hunting uh, outside the palace walls, and then they sneak back into the palace. Uh, so so when, when the king and his brother, when they awake, they sat at the palace window, watching the garden and chatting until the light broke, the day dawned, and the sun rose. And as they watched, the private gate opened, and there emerged, as usual, the wife of King Sharayar, walking among 20 slave girls, they made their way under the trees until they stood below the palace window where the two kings sat. Then they took off their women's clothes and suddenly there were 10 slaves who mounted the 10 girls and made love to them. And as for the lady, she called Masood, Masood. And the black slave jumped from the tree to the ground, came to her and said, what do you want, you slut? Here is Sa'ad al-Din Masood. And she laughed and fell on her back while the slave mounted her and like the others did his business with her. And then the back black slaves got up, washed themselves, putting on the same clothes, mingled with the girls. Then they walked away, entered the palace and locked the gate behind them. And as for Masood, he jumped over the fence to the road and went on his way. And here endeth the lesson. You can see why, you can see why King Shariar would uh, become a kind of a uh, Orientalist bluebeard, uh, not trusting women uh, at any point, you know, not thinking there is any point in even entertaining that that notion. So be honest, how many of you knew that backstory to to the king and Shahrazad? Mm. That, was that familiar to any of you? I see a lot of heads shaking side to side. Yeah, it's oh yes, uh, Linda, yes. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, we we have a, a series of videos called Great Courses, and that story was in them. Oh, so okay. Oh, I, love, I love that series, yes. Thank very you. very the admirable. Three Princes of Sarajip. I'm sorry? Three Princes of Sarajip, that's an oriental story. Okay, so so you think there may be a connection with uh, the frame story of, uh, of the Arabian Princess Nights Sarajip. and, and that story? It's another, another Arabic type story. Where okay. The three princes were under, underneath an elephant and had to describe the various parts of the elephant. And he, one felt the trunk, the other one felt the leg. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So that's where the word serendipity comes from. Ah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's, yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's a very rich story, storytelling tradition with, without, without any question. Uh, anyways, uh, you can see this is not kid stuff. I mean, this is this is this is real uh, serious adult literature. Uh, and you know, when this when this book was published, uh, you know, in an edition by Sir Richard Burton, he didn't want to leave out any of this adult stuff. Uh, he that that's what he really I think was really interested in his heart of hearts. And uh, he actually had he couldn't actually publish these stories in the traditional way through a regular publisher. He had to do it as a kind of a publication through a private society in which people could only subscribe as like members of a, of a club would subscribe to something. Uh, and that was the only way legally he could uh, get out these uh, translations uh, uh, without being persecuted for obscenity or being a pornographer. Uh, and there's a lot, and he really did kind of uh, accentuate the pornographic aspects of these Arabian night stories. Uh, so I think let's take 10 minutes. We come back, maybe we can uh, hear a little bit of the Arabian nights from the uh, Sir Richard Burton 
translation of these stories. And uh, I think we'll hit the three, the big three, uh, Aladdin, uh, Sinbad, and, uh, and uh, Ali, Alibaba. And uh, we'll learn a little about Mr. Burton and his, uh, uh, you know, little uh, eccentricities. Uh, and uh, we'll see that he had a very individual look literarily as well in terms of his uh, writing style. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see if it uh, maybe works with this, this uh, treasure trove of uh, literature. So let's take a little break, little intermission and come back in 10 minutes and uh, uh, crack open a few of these classic uh, mm. uh, stories of the Arabian Nights. Thank you.
How you doing, Dan? Hi, Mike. Doing fine. Did you get a shot yet? No. Have you? Yeah, I get one Thursday. I'm scheduled. Where, where'd you go? Uh, I'm going up to UB. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, what is the, what's the setup there? I have mine on the 23rd. If you're going there, you know, uh, if you go on the Bailey Avenue side, yeah, the second driveway, it's directly across the street from the VA. You turn in there and they got signs that almost took you by the hand to bring you back to the building. It's the okay. uh, pharmacy school building in the back. Right. Yeah, so but they got a lot of signs and I just took a ride up there Sunday because the sun was shining uh, just to see it and um, very well laid out. I mean, you, it's hard to get lost. Thank you. I will follow that advice. Yeah, it's uh, it's very easy to get to. Uh, I mean, they got... <laughs> You can't miss a sign. If you miss a sign, you're not you're not driving well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking forward to it. Did they schedule a second appointment for you? No, they do it after they give you the first shot. What you have one now for the second one? No, this schedule? is my first one. My uh, daughter was there uh. last last week. And got one, you said they give you your appointment for the second one immediately, right after you got the first one. Okay. It looks like uh, most of us are back. Welcome back. <clears throat> music, uh, music I've been playing uh, during the break is uh, the overture from a TV musical of Aladdin uh, from the late 1950s. Music and lyrics by Cole Porter. And I think it was the last uh, project he worked on uh, at the end of his uh, career. Uh, it's got some lovely little tunes in there. Anyways, uh, just, uh, you know, if you, if you want to uh, explore uh, Aladdin and Cole Porter, you can look it up on YouTube and hear a lot of uh, cute little songs. So uh, just uh, something to check out in your spare time. In the meantime, uh, getting back to the Arabian Nights, uh, uh, I'd say probably before this uh, this modern translation by Hussein Hadoui, probably, probably the best known translation in English is by uh, this uh, British writer, uh, Sir Richard Burton, no relation to the actor. And uh, this is a nice edition of uh, his translation that I got at Barnes and Noble. And uh, it's a handsome, handsomely produced uh, hardcover edition, uh, certainly uh, worthy uh, to line your library shelves, I, I'd say. Uh, but uh, uh, 
I'd say probably in his in his lifetime, uh, this Sir Richard Burton, no relation to the actor, by the way, uh, was probably best known as a as an adventurer and, and explorer. Uh, I mean, for example, um, he he managed to uh, to uh, take the uh, annual pilgrimage that uh, uh, um, that followers of Islam take uh, to uh, uh, to Mecca during Ramadan. He managed to be one of those uh, uh, pilgrims in 1853. Uh, this is not something Europeans really were generally permitted to do. This was this was a pilgrimage that uh, uh, was pretty much only intended for uh, adherents of the of the Islamic faith. But uh, but uh, Burton really prepared himself thoroughly uh, for for doing this. In fact, I even think that he uh, actually was uh, you know uh, you know he actually studied uh, to 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 become a Muslim. In order that he could actually go on this, uh, go on this uh, excursion, this this pilgrimage. Uh, in fact, it says that uh, at, at a certain point, it says that Burton was entitled to call himself a Hafiz. Remember that name from last week's class, Hafiz, which one can uh, translate as someone who can recite the Quran by memory. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I guess probably. Uh, uh, Burton uh, managed to uh, get himself to that uh, to that point, uh, and uh, and so he was able to uh, really, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, you know, make himself, in a sense, what they what his friends might have said, go, going native. You know, he he went native in a big way in order to to make this pilgrimage uh, to to Mecca and M M Medina. Uh, so so that's uh, I think a real uh, you know tribute to his ability to uh, assimilate uh, culture. Uh, also, he did a great deal of exploration in, uh, in Africa. Uh, he tried to find the source of the Nile River. And uh, uh, supposedly, he was one of the first Europeans to, to find Lake Tanganyika uh, in 1858. Uh, he was a really daring person. Uh, supposedly, on, on these African explorations, uh, he actually got uh, involved in a in a melee where uh, his party was surrounded by uh, a number of uh, you know uh, warriors or something, and uh, he really barely escaped from that uh, confrontation. He uh, I guess uh, a, a spear poked through his cheeks, you know, and he actually you know was you know had scars, uh, you know that uh, remained uh, from that uh, you know uh, that injury. Uh, so, uh, you know, he really uh, went through the mill in his uh, various world explorations. What, one of the places that he explored was in America. He went out west in America and he got to know and study the uh, Mormon community in Utah. And he actually met Brigham Young. And of his 40 plus books, there's at least one book about that uh, American uh, Mormon adventure that, that he took. So he really roamed the world over, probably one of the great uh, adventure travelers of the 19th century. But, uh, but in later years, uh, in his, uh, in his you know, late 50s and 60s, uh, you, know, he, you know, he was in you know, poorer health you know, because of all these earlier exertions. And, uh, and I think he really focused mainly on his literary work in that final dozen years, uh, last dozen years of, of his life. Uh, and uh, among the things that he, uh, that he put his attention to with, with that, uh, in that period was uh, to, to translate the uh, Arabian Nights stories. Now at the very time that he was getting down to that seriously, there was another British writer named John Payne, another expert in Oriental studies who was also working on a translation. And so I think there was a bit of a uh, rivalry between the two translators, a friendly, transla friendly rivalry. But uh, the, uh, 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 there were many people who uh, look at uh, Burton's uh, work on the tales and think that he may have done a bit of plagiarizing of the, of the <laughs> translations by this John Payne. Uh, so that's a very controversial subject, and I haven't really been able to 
look into that my, myself. But uh, uh, nevertheless, there were these two uh, people trying to, you know, do the whole Arabian Nights in the, you know, 1880s. And, uh, and uh, I would say that uh, Burton's translation, I don't know if it was the better, but it became the more popular. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, it definitely made a big impression and that it certainly became the standard translation for uh, at least uh, the late 19th and uh, early 20th centuries. Um, and uh, so it was brought out in 1885 in a set of 10 volumes. And then uh, between 1886 and 1888, he brought out six uh, supplemental volumes uh, to, to fill out the uh, repertoire of, uh, of Arabic uh, tales. And, and I guess uh, he, uh, he uh, it was a privately published piece, as I said, you know, that he had to publish it as a kind of a, a little, uh, you know, invited club. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, but uh, he managed to skirt the, the censorship authorities through that means. And he actually, you know, made about 16,000 guineas uh, you know, through the publication of that book, and he was able to live uh, fairly comfortably, uh, you know, on the basis of that, uh, you know, publication. Uh, so one of the one of the controversies about the book is the literary style. Uh, so it says that in in creating this uh, translation, um, he uh, he basically used a style, an older style of English similar to the style of maybe a Geoffrey Chaucer or, or an Ed Edmund Spencer, uh, you know, very much uh, an antique form uh, of English. Uh, and uh, the, there's a biography I have about him, uh, Burton Snow Upon the Desert uh, by uh, Frank McLean. Uh, and uh, in this book, it says that uh, uh, Burton's fam familiar pedantry is much in evidence in this translation. He insisted on the correct anglicized version of Arab words, even though the incorrect ones were well known and had passed into usage. For example, Sindbad, rather for Sinbad, or Aladin, rather for Aladdin, was merely the most obvious examples. He also insisted on, on giving the correct Arabic forms uh, for well-known places, uh, Alexandria, Greece, Abyssinia, Africa, Etc. Some words, such as the variants of Allah used in odes, he did not bother to translate at all, thus forcing the reader to refer to the footnotes. Uh, similarly, in the interest of strict accuracy, he avoided well-known words like dragoman, which again forced the reader to consult an English dictionary. Uh, and uh, he, he was inconsistent. Sometimes he would use uh, the word, the name Solomon, or the Arabic form Suleiman. Uh, and more worry, wearisome was his insistence on using obscure and archaic words or French expressions for which there is a perfectly good English equivalent. And alongside this, there was a disconcerting countervailing use of slang, even Americanisms. Burton's own fragmented identity uh, uh, help explain the sh startling shifts from the heroic to the vulgar mode. So Burton justified this mixed mode of contemporary and Chaucerian English. And he wrote, the original Arabic is highly composite. It does not disdain local terms, bywords, and allusions, and it borrows indiscriminately from Persian, from Turkish, and from Sanskrit. As its equivalent in vocabulary, I could devise only a somewhat archaical English whose old fashioned and sub antique flavor would contrast with our modern and everyday speech, admitting even at times, even Latin or French terms. My conviction remains that it represents with much truth to nature, the motley suit of the Arabo Egyptian. The translator of the original mind will not neglect the frequent opportunities of enriching his own mother tongue with alien and novel uh, adornments. So, if I read the opening frame tale in uh, in Mr. in in Sir Richard's uh, version, I think you would find it a very different uh, experience, uh, and it takes a little getting used to this strange melange of of then nineteenth century and middle aged 
uh, English. But you know, this is a collection of stories of both the ordinary and the, the ordinary meeting the, the marvelous or meeting the extraordinary. And I think you need a special kind of language to deal with that meeting of the natural and the supernatural. And I think the more that I read Bur Burton's version of the tales, the more I begin to think, yeah, I don't think you can use an everyday kind of English for these not so everyday events. Uh, you, you do you need, do need something a little supercharged. And uh, as disconcerting as this Burton language is, it does seem to kind of jibe with the truly astonishing events and characters in these stories. I mean, uh, you know, when you when you read about genies and mag magic carpet flying uh, things uh, and things like that, that uh, we're not in any kind of realistic narrative. Uh, so I think that to have a language that is by no means everyday uh, English, English uh, kind of makes a strange kind of sense. So that's one controversy to deal with Burton's translation. And the other has to do with his seeming obsession with sex and sexual mores in the Arabic world. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, this, is uh, what, uh, this is what this Frank McGlynn has, has to say uh, about this. Uh, the tales are saturated with sex. Some people have asserted that the true inspiration of the knights is a profound sexual distrust of women. Misogynism and the fear of the essential lustfulness of women is certainly there in abundance, beginning with the orgy and the porter's tale in book one, where Burton uses the quaint terms prickle and cointy to describe the male and female sexual organs. In book six, the story of the three wishes is dedicated to the proposition that an extra inch of penis constitutes the female dream of paradise. A man granted three wishes is egged on by his wife to ask for a huge organ. His wish is granted and his member becomes as huge as a column. He then has to give up the second wish in getting rid of this gigantic phallus, then a third in restoring things to the original position. The moral is that even in, if granted his deepest desires, a man would probably be ruined by his wife's lust. It's always the woman's, uh, the woman's to blame. Uh, so again, patriarchy, that's, it's, it's right. Uh, and uh, it talks about uh, uh, that there are four homosexual examples in the, in, the, in the stories, though not lengthy enough to justify the exhaustive treatment of the subject by Burton in his notes, 50 pages of notes about homosexuality. Uh, and uh, one of the reviewers for this collection said, probably no European has ever gathered such an appalling collection of degrading customs and statistics of vice. It is a work which no decent gentleman will long permit to stand upon his, his, his shelves. Galland is for the nursery, Edward Lane is for the library, Payne is for the study, and Burton is for the sewers. <laughs> so you can see why a lot of uh, people have had uh, problems with, with Burton's translation, both in terms of the literary style and in terms of the, uh, in terms of the okay. salacious aspect that he seems to accent in his uh, translation. Uh, by the way, I have to say that if you are at all interested in this wildly eccentric, heroic figure, this Richard Francis Burton, you can go to a website that I just discovered today no, called, uh, called Burtoniana.org, uh, spelled B-U-R-T-O-N-I-A-N-A, -A, Burtoniana.org. And you will not only find all kinds of references to uh, you know, facts about his life and his literary production, but you will also find uh, a section where you can uh, call up a PDF document with all of his books uh, and you can actually read from these, these various books. And by the way, 
among these various books is probably the first English translation of the Kama Sutra, that Hindu classic sex manual. And uh, by golly, I, 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 found, I found a copy of the book on, on the internet. And, uh, and it it's, makes for kind of dry reading, but uh, back then at the end of the 19th century, pretty hot stuff, pretty hot stuff. Uh, so Richard Burton was the guy who gave that uh, uh, Hindu classic uh, to uh, European readers. So we can thank him for that as well. Meanwhile, in the time remaining, let's, let's read a little bit from the, uh, from the Arabian Nights. Uh, let's take a look at, uh, uh, draw from the, the big three. So first of all, let's take a little bit, a little look at Sinbad the Sailor. Uh, the, uh, and, and, and you know, but by, by the way, uh, the, uh, you know, this is an example of one of those uh, stories that has uh, these sub stories built into it. Although I, I'd say since this comes not specifically from the uh, original Galand manuscript, that it's a little different in feeling. This feels more like a, like a television series, let us say, or, or, a, or a series of movies and its sequels. Uh, uh, you do get the frame of uh, this, you know, this, uh, uh, this Sinbad, this uh, merchant sailor figure talking to a, uh, you know, a sort of a porter who comes to his mansion to, to deliver goods. And, and he says, oh, come in, uh, I'll tell you some of my adventures. And uh, in the course of this uh, Sinbad saga, you get a chance to hear about seven voyages that Sinbad took in his various uh, adventures. Uh, so let's, uh, let's hear first uh, the frame and then we'll hear a bit of the actual first voyage. So, so it goes like this. And again, here is Burton's very individual uh, style of telling the story. There lived in the city of Baghdad during the reign of the commander of the faithful Harun al-Rashid. Oh, by the way, let me just stop here. Harun al-Rashid, that was a real ruler uh, in the Middle East. That was a real caliph uh, in this uh, uh, Arabic kingdom. Uh, and uh, uh, there, it, it was a historical figure in say the uh, 700s, the 800s. And uh, he later became a legendary figure. And uh, there are numerous tales in these Arabian Nights in which Harun al-Rashid figures as a character or as a reference in the stories. And you can kind of almost date some of these stories uh, depending on whether it mentions Harun al-Rashid uh, or, or not. Uh, so uh, so that's, a, that's a key sort of subcategory uh, within these Arabian Nights stories. Anyway, uh, there lived in the city of Baghdad during the reign of the commander of the faithful Harun al-Rashid a man named Sinbad the Hamal, one in poor case who bore burdens on his head for hire. So he carried things on his head for, uh, for, uh, for his job. It happened to him one day of great heat that whilst he was carrying a heavy load, he became exceeding weary and sweated profusely, the heat and weight alike oppressing him. Presently, as he was passing the gate of a merchant's house, before which the ground was swept and watered, and there the air was temperate. He sighed a broad, he sighted a broad bench beside the door, so he set his load thereon to take rest and smell the air. There came out upon him from the court door a pleasant breeze and a delicious fragrance. He sat down on the edge of the bench and at once heard from within the melodious sound of lutes and other stringed instruments and mirth exciting voices, singing and reciting together with the song of birds warbling and, the, and glorifying almighty Allah in various tunes and tongues. Turtles, mockingbirds, merles, nightingales, uh, and stone curlows, whereat he marveled in himself and was moved to mighty joy and solace. Then he went up to the gate and saw within a great flower garden wherein were pages and black slaves 
and such a train of servants and attendants and so forth as is found only with kings and sultans. And his nostrils were greeted with the savory odors of all manner meats, rich and delicate and delicious and generous wines. So he raised his eyes heavenwards and said, Glory to thee, O Lord, and creator and provider, who providest whomso thou wilt without count or stint. O mine holy one, I cry thee pardon for all sins and turning to thee, repenting all, all offenses. O Lord, there is no gainsaying thee in thine ordinance and thy dominion, neither wilt thou be questioned of that thou dost. For thou indeed over all things art almighty. Extolled be thy perfection, whom thou wilt thou make poor, and whom thou wilt thou makest rich. Whom thou wilt thou exaltest, and whom thou wilt thou abasest. And there is no God but thou. How mighty is thy majesty, and how enduring thy dominion, and how excellent thy government. Verily, thou favorest whom thou wilt of thy servants, whereby the owner of this place abideth in all joyance of life, and delighteth himself with pleasant scents, and delicious meats, and exquisite wines of all kinds. For indeed thou appointest unto thy creatures that which thou wilt, and that which thou hast foreordained unto them, wherefore are some weary, and others are at rest, and some enjoy fair fortune and affluence, while others suffer the extreme of travail and misery, even as I do. And then he fell into reciting. And, and by the way, there's a lot of poetry in these Arabian Nights. And some of the poems in these, uh, in these stories are in the form of the Persian poetic form, the Ghazal, which we talked about last week. And, and occasionally, this uh, Richard Burton occasionally does use or tries to use this Gosel form in his own attempts at versification. I'm not sure if this is one of them or not, but let's, let's hear it. It kind of has that feeling. So this is the, the porter saying, how many by my labors that evermore endure all goods of life enjoy and in coolly shade recline. Each morn that dawns, I wake in travail and in woe and strange is my condition and my burden gars me pine. Many others are in luck and from miseries are free and fortune never loads them with loads the like of mine. They live their happy days in all solace and delight, eat, drink and dwell in honor mid the noble and the dine. All living things were made of a little drop of sperm. Thine or origin is mine and my providence is thine. Yet the difference and distance twixt the twain of us are far as the difference of savor twixt vinegar and wine. But at thee, O God, all wise, I venture not to rail, whose ordinance is just and whose justice cannot fail. It's kind, kind of a gozzle, kind of a gozzle. When Sinbad the porter had made an end of reciting his verses, he bore up his burden and was about to fare on when there came forth to him from the gate a little front page, a, a little a little foot page, fair of face and shapely of shape and, and dainty of dress, who caught him by the hand, saying, Come in and speak with my Lord, for he calleth for thee. The porter would have excused himself to the page, but the lad would take no refusal. So he left his load with the doorkeeper in the vestibule and followed the boy into the house which he found to be a goodly mansion, radiant and full of majesty, till he brought him to a grand sitting room wherein he saw a company of nobles and great lords seated at tables garnished with all manner of flowers and sweet scented herbs, besides great plenty of dainty viands and fruits dried and fresh and confections and wines of the choicest vintages. Then there also were instruments of music and mirth and lovely slave girls playing and singing. All the company was ranged according to rank and in the highest place sat a man of worshipful and noble aspect whose beard sides hoariness had stricken. And he was stately of stature and fair of favor, agreeable if of aspect and full of gravity and dignity and majesty. 
So Sinbad the porter was confounded at that which he beheld and said to himself, by Allah, this must be either a prince of paradise or some king's palace. And then he saluted uh, the company with much respect, praying for their prosperity and kissing the ground before them, stood with his head bowed down in humble attitude. Sinbad the porter, after kissing ground be be between their hands, stood with his head bowed down in humble attitude. The master of the house bade him draw near and be seated and bespoke him kindly, bidding him welcome. Then he set before him various kinds of viands, rich and delicate and de delicious. And the porter, after saying his bismala, fell to and ate his fill, after which he exclaimed, praise be Allah, whence be our case, whatso be our case. And washing his hands, returned thanks to the company for his entertainment. Quoth the host, thou art welcome, and the day is a, is a blessed. But what is thy name and calling? Quoth the other, O oh my Lord, my name is Sinbad the Hamel, and I carry folks' goods on my head for hire. The housemaster smiled and rejoined, Know, O porter, that thy name is even as mine, for I am Sinbad the sailor. And now, O porter, I would have thee let me hear the couplets thou recitest at the gate anon. The porter was abashed and replied, Allah upon thee, excuse me for toil and travail and lack of luck when the hand is empty. Teach a man ill manners and boorish ways, uh, said the host. Be not ashamed, thou art become my brother, but repeat to me the verses, for they pleased me when as I heard thee recite them at the gate. Hereupon the porter repeated the couplets, and they delighted the merchant who said to him, Know, O Hamel, that my story is a wonderful one, and thou shalt hear all that befell me, and all I underwent ere I rose to this state of prosperity, and became the lord of this place wherein thou seest me. For I came not to this high estate, save after travail, sore, and perils galore, and how much toil and trouble have I not suffered in days of yore. I have made seven voyages, by each of which hangeth a marvelous tale, such as confoundeth the reason. All and all this came to pass by doom of fortune and fate. For from what destiny doth right there is neither refuge nor flight. Know then, good my lords, continued he, that I am about to relate the first voyage of Sinbad the sailor. And I'll just stop there. So this is this is one of those cases of embedded stories within a larger frame story. So what you heard is part, the outer part of that frame, this uh, cajoling of Sinbad the porter to come inside and listen to these seven uh, adventures of, of Sinbad uh, the sailor. Uh, so it's, it's a very a very unique kind of structure, uh, a very non-European literary structure. And yet people from uh, uh, people later on after in after times, uh, after Arabian Nights were published, uh, they began to make use of these uh, uh, Near Eastern uh, literary structures uh, and started writing things that were not purely linear, uh, narratives, but uh, narratives where things, you know, backpedaled into the past or, or, uh, or uh, leapt into the future or, uh, or went around in a circle more, uh, uh, more like, Mark, uh, like the, uh, the, the Arabian Nights tales are, 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 are structured. Uh, James Joyce, for example, uh, there's an entry for James Joyce in that Arabian Nights encyclopedia, and it says that uh, there are passages in Finnegan's Wake and in Ulysses by James Joyce that are very much beholden as much to the Arabian Nights as, uh, as Joyce is beholden to uh, Homer's uh, Odyssey. Uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, in the field of modern day world literature, the influence of the Arabian Nights is quite significant, quite significant. Uh, so it's about three o'clock now. Uh, maybe I could just dip into a little bit, a little bit of the uh, Alibaba, and his 40 thieves, uh, because here's a key phrase that's a little different 
in Burton's telling than in the ones that we are familiar with. And I think it's just kind of funny that uh, we stumble upon this in, in Burton's version. So Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, just a quick uh, trot through until uh, we reach a certain point where we'll have to close up. In the days of yore and in times and tides long gone before, there dwelt in a certain town of Persia, Persia, two brothers, one named Kasim and the other Alibaba, who at their father's demise had divided the little wealth he had left to them with equitable division and had lost no time in wasting and spending it all. The elder, however, presently took to himself a wife, the daughter of an opulent merchant, so that when his father-in-law fared to the mercy of almighty Allah, he became owner of a large shop filled with rare goods and costly wares and of a storehouse stocked with precious stuffs likewise of much gold that was buried in the ground. Thus was he known throughout the city as a substantial man. But the woman whom Ali Baba had married was poor and needy. They lived therefore in a mean hovel and Ali, ba Ali Baba eked out a scanty livelihood uh, by the sale of fuel, which he daily collected in the jungle and carried about the town to the bazaar upon his three asses. Now it chanced one day that Ali Baba had cut dead branches and dry fuel sufficient for his need and had placed the load upon his beasts when suddenly he espied a dust cloud spiring high in air to his right and moving rapidly towards him. And when he closely considered it, he described, described a troop of henchmen um, is, um, see, he described a troop of horsemen riding on a mane and about to reach him. At this sight, he was sore alarmed and fearing lest perchance they were a band of bandits who would slay him and drive off his donkeys. In his affright, he began to run. But for as much as they were near hand and he could not escape from out the forest, he drove his animals laden with the fuel into a byway of the bushes and swarmed up a thick trunk of a huge tree to hide himself therein. And he sat upon a branch whence he could descry everything beneath him whilst none below could catch a glimpse of him above. And that tree grew close beside a rock which towered high above head. The horsemen, young, active, and doughty riders came close up to the rock face and all dismounted whereat Ali Baba took good note of them and soon he was fully persuaded by their mien and demeanor that they were a troop of highwaymen who having fallen upon a caravan had despoiled it and carried off the spoil and brought their booty to the place with intent of concealing it safely in some cash. Moreover, he observed that they were 40 in number. Ali Baba, saw the robbers each unbridle his horse and hobble it. Then all took off their saddlebags, which proved to be full of gold and silver. The man who seemed to be the captain presently pushed forwards, load on shoulder through thorns and thickets till he came up, till he came up to a certain spot where he uttered these strange words. Open, O oh, Sim Sim. And forthwith appeared, forthwith appeared a wide doorway in the face of the rock. The robbers went in and last of all their chief and then the portal shut of itself. Long while they stayed within the cave whilst Ali Baba was constrained to abide perched upon the tree, reflecting that if he came down per event per adventure, the band might issue forth at that very moment and seize him and slay him. At last he had determined to mount one of the horses and driving on his asses to return townwards when suddenly the portal drew open. The robber chief was first to issue forth, then standing on the entrance, he saw and counted his men as they came out. And lastly, he spake the magic words, shut, O Sim Sim, whereat the door closed of itself. When all had passed muster, and review each slung on his saddlebags and bridled his own horse. And as soon as ready, 
they rode off, led by the leader in the direction whence they came. What? Open, O Simpson? Shut, O Simpson? What's this, O Simpson? Shouldn't it be O Sesame? Sesame. Open Sesame. 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 What <laughs> happened to that? Well, I think here is I think here is Burton trying to show off his multilingual uh, facilities. Supposedly, supposedly Burton uh, was familiar with at least twenty-five or twenty-six, at least twenty-six languages. He had a lot to show off, and he's constantly showing off in this book of the Arabian Nights. So I think he's trying to use the original version of the name for Sesame in the original either Arabic or Persian. He's trying to be very close to this Persian form of the word. And consequently, he's making everyone scratch their head when they come upon this part in the book. But, uh, uh, but yes, I looked up Sesame on the internet and sure enough, Sim Sim does come up. But as the name of Sesame in the East African areas, so that's where that's where Burton picked this up uh, when he was exploring in in East Africa. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, scholars, Arabic scholars, Middle Eastern scholars, look. You know, they roll their eyes when they look at what Burton did because, in many cases, he's like trying to create a supercharged language that really distorts what's in the actual uh, Ar Arabic. Uh, and uh, consequently, it's not really, re not really good translation. Uh, but uh, it does make for thrilling reading, you know, and for something with such, again, larger than life events, as the events in these stories. Uh, again, it, it kind of makes sense that the language itself should be kind of uh, one of a kind uh, as well. But I would, I would agree with the majority of Arabian Nights readers, let's stick with open sesame because, I mean, it's, that's just part of our cultural heritage. You just cannot uh, ignore that, you know, it just, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it would be like calling Aladdin a different name because it would be more faithful to the Arabic. Uh, no, it's got to call him Aladdin. You got to say open sesame when it comes to <laughs> Alibaba. Anyways, uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating literary tradition, and I encourage you to uh, look up your translation of choice uh, at your local library or, uh, or bookstore. Uh, next week, we are going to look at another leading literary figure, uh, namely the Persian scientist, mathematician, and poet Omar Khayyam. Oh, and we will look at how his verse has been adapted by the English poet Ed Edward Fitzgerald to create the classic Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. In the meantime, time is gone, and I have to say, close Sesame, put the rock back in the cave, and say there's no more treasures to be had. Thank you very much for your attention, and I, uh, I wish you the best fortunes in your uh, own personal Arabian Nights adventures. So thank you again. We'll see you next week. And uh, till next time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Bye -bye. Thank right. you. Bye bye. Bye. Serendipity. Bye bye. Yeah. Wait a second. Leave meeting. Oh. See that. Hmm. Thirty five dollars. They, I just got an email just before I went in. The classes are open. You can register. Thirty-five dollars. That's a lot. Ada. It's going to be on Zoom or you go to the. No, it's. Zoom. Yep. Okay, we can do that on our way home Thursday. Tomorrow. Tomorrow? What's tomorrow? Wednesday. I know, Wednesday. That's when you go to the
Oh, it's right. Tomorrow we got that running around to do. If it wasn't closer, I would walk over there and get it while I'm waiting for you to come and pick me up. Oh, this this. I don't know if I'll remember half of this here, but it. Uh, I don't know why you write it down. Well, I just put. I don't write it down. I just put things I hopefully will plot click into my memory. Why do you need to put it on there? Well, stuff like you know. The average people I meet with don't know about uh, uh, Arabian Nights, the story of the two kings. One king uh, goes to visit his his brother was another king in a nearby area. And uh, before he leaves, he goes on a hunting exhibition to, to bring up some presents to his brother. And as when he goes, his wife who thinks he's gone already is has an affair with the baker boy and he catches her and then he he beats her and slays her and he feels so bad he doesn't tell his brother about it and he just feels very sad so when he gets to his brother's place he um, is not happy although his brother gives him a everything he wants and does everything for him and really does you know, treats him well and he just feels so bad for himself he's not doing anything he's dull he's not thankful nothing and uh so his brother goes on a hunting trip to get more stuff that he can give his brother to take home with him. And while he's gone, his brother is gone. So he stays, is, stays there and he's looking out the window. And what happens is that there are 40, uh, no, there are 12. 12 of his brother's handmaidens and 12 black uh, or white and 12 black men come out and he's looking out the window and he sees they all go to uh, they all go take their, their clothes off and they all are having sex an orgy huh? an orgy and uh, and then, then the uh, one of the chief black men comes down from a tree, and now this guy's sister-in-law, because his brother's wife, starts having an orgy with this other black man. He's got this black and white, and this was written way back pre-18th century and he looks down and was feeling sorry for himself because of what he saw his wife doing and then he witnessed all of this and uh he begins to feel well gee my brother's got it worse off than i got it so why feeling bad so he begins to feel better now uh -huh. so when his brother comes back he ends up uh, telling his brother about this story and what he saw. And his brother goes and just say, it's very common. Uh -huh. <laughs> and 
married and he killed his wife. And he killed his wife. Yeah. So that was uh Those stairs that we saw going every which way, there's a butler's pantry um, resident along with the house. And then they went upstairs with all the windows as a sunroom or a reflection room or. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was the Arabian night. And then we talked about. Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, all that sort of written. What we were learning, not necessarily the story itself, what we were what learning there was that 